to Nuked Radio. This is episode 41. Today is Tuesday, June 19th, 2012. I'm your host, Christina Consolo. And with me is usually Jules, but she's not here today. She has the day off. So I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about her when she's not here. And I want to tell everyone how much I appreciate her and how I couldn't do half the stuff, if not more, that I'm doing now to spread the word about Fukushima without her help. And I'm going to share some stats with you guys in a moment that are just going to blow you away. Because of her, I'm able to do this show. I'm able to keep up on my YouTube stuff, videos, forecasts. I'm writing for On the Lie. She's promoting my articles, promoting my videos, just getting the word out through every avenue possible. So we can flood the internet with articles, Facebook pages, videos, and I encourage others to keep sharing as much as possible, which you guys have been doing, apparently. Jules is a marketing genius, and when her and I met, it was like someone plugged another brain into mine, opening up just a whole new arena of possibility. She cares deeply about this problem and people and humanity. She pours her heart and soul into every project that she takes on. And she has a little girl who's graduating from kindergarten today. Congratulations, Paige. You have a wonderful mommy. And even her five-year-old knows more about mitigation than most adults, which is going to be really important as she goes on to have a healthy life because not only is the mitigation going to help her avoid radiation, but it's going to help her with other environmental pollutants, which our kids and our grandkids are going to be dealing with their whole lives. I'm very lucky to have Jules in my life. In fact, I will be taking a little break next week to go and visit her so her and I can hang out and strategize and plan on where we need to go next to reach an even wider audience. And I also want to thank our listeners and all the people in chat that show up here week after week, and the other hosts on Orion for being supportive. Nuked Radio will be on at its usual time next week, and we'll be running some pre-recorded interviews. I'm going to um, change up the forecast a little bit and load it up with some links to teach people how to do their own fallout forecasts next week. And that's something that we're all going to need to do, especially since... The Weather Channel doesn't seem to want to do it. The big news is the typhoon today. But before we get into that, uh, let me just give you some of these numbers. On the Radchick page alone, we have 2,304 likes. But those 2,304 people have been just widely sharing stuff because just in the last week, 611 to 617, we reached 46,309 people just by sharing posts. Another 2,300 we reached on Mutation Watch, and I've got some analytics to break that down actually by country, which I thought was really interesting from Fukushima Facts. And I wanted to point out, too, if you can't get people interested in the subject of Fukushima per se, you might be able to share some of our other pages with them and bring them into this topic from that direction, Mutation Watch, Farming and Fallout, Fukushima is Falling Apart, Are You Ready? That's also a Facebook page of ours. And we've got a couple of nuclear generating stations or nuclear power plants listed as well. Prairie Island has its own page, Diablo Canyon, Vermont Yankee, Hanford, North Anna, Brunswick, San Onofre, Byron, and Fort Calhoun and Cooper I put as one since there's a blackout on both. I'm going to be starting pages on Fermi, Palisades, and Davis Bessie this week. And then we just try to hit it as problems come up, which is, as you all know, is, pre- is pretty frequently. On the Fukushima Facts Analytics, this is the breakdown by country. The United States, of course, was the highest with 10,000 
123 recent visits. Second is Canada. Third, United Kingdom. Fourth is Australia, followed by 248 people in New Zealand, 198 people in Japan, 168 people in the Netherlands, 139 people in Germany, South Africa, Taiwan, Czech Republic, France, Finland, Philippines, Sweden, 33 people in Switzerland, 32 people in Iceland, Costa Rica, Slovakia, Hong Kong, Spain, Israel, Mexico, Ireland. We have 21 people that's found us in Singapore, Austria, Brazil, Belgium, Thailand, Italy, Denmark. We even have 11 people from Malaysia, Portugal, Ecuador, South Korea, Norway, Poland, Indonesia, Slovenia, Panama, Bolivia, Croatia, India, Nicaragua, Saudi Arabia, Bulgaria, Greece, Puerto Rico, United Arab Emirates, Argentina, China, Romania, Turkey. We have three people from Fiji that found us, Hungary, Sri Lanka, Serbia, Russia, Ukraine, Colombia, Ghana, Guam, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Barbados, Chile, Cyprus, Estonia, Iraq, Cayman Islands, Luxembourg, Latvia, Morocco, Macau, Malta, Mauritius. not sure I said that right, Nambia, Nigeria, Nepal, Peru, Pakistan, and Uruguay. So I'm glad that they're here and they found us. Now, what's on everybody's mind, though, is this typhoon that's going on in Japan. In fact, this is the latest that I found from the United States Department of State Bureau of Diplomatic Security. Emergency message for U.S. citizens in Japan, updated typhoon warning. This was published this morning. This emergency message is an update to the message sent about Typhoon, they call it 12-04W, that was issued on Monday, June 18th. This emergency message is being issued to alert U.S. citizens residing or traveling in the Kansai region of Japan that the Japan Meteorolog Meteorological Agency has issued alerts for a Category 4 equivalent storm. As of local time, June 19th, it was located off the shore of Shikoku, it is expected to approach closest to Osaka on the evening of June 19th. The U.S. Consulate General in Osaka, Kobe, will be closed to the public. They report that the maximum sustained wind speed near the center of the storm is currently 78 miles per hour, gusts up to 112. At least that's downgraded from 184, like they were saying two days ago. Winds are expected to maintain strength over the next 72 hours, and there's been quite a bit of discrepancy between various sources reporting on this that it's going to weaken depending on how much it tracks over the mountainous regions of Japan. There's still, you know, of course, some uncertainty as to its direct path. Sustained maximum winds when a storm makes landfall on Osaka are predicted to be as high as 34 miles per hour gusting to 101. Now, right now, there's a video that I dropped into chat of what Tokyo looks like downtown right now. You can see people are getting blown around there pretty bad already, and it's still about six hours off from the Tokyo. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the typhoon and other related weather. When we come back, you're listening to Nuked Radio. Somewhere waiting for me, my lover stands on and welcome back to Nuked Radio. Just to um, continue on this bulletin, throughout the day of June 19th, the storm is forecast to pass near Shikoku and pass through the Kansai and Kantu regions, gradually weakening, bringing heavy rains as it passes. In fact, the highest I saw was 20 inches. Due to the possibility of strong winds, heavy rain, flooding, and landslides, some municipalities have announced preparations for evacuation. Several Japanese rail and airlines have also announced limited or canceled service. I believe the, um, the trains in Tokyo at this time have been shut down. 
U.S. citizens in Japan and the affected regions should continue to monitor local news outlets and consult with local authorities for updates as the storm approaches. And then they have this little uh, message here. The embassy will to c continue to monitor and issue updated messages, locate shelter, monitor media reports, follow official instructions, carry your travel documents with you at all times, passport, birth certificate, picture IDs, secure them in a safe waterproof location. You should also contact friends and family in the U.S. if you're a U.S. citizen with updates about your whereabouts. But boy, if I had a friends or family in Japan, there's a lot more to worry about, too, than just the storm. What's going to happen to all that cyanobacteria and that highly radioactive black dust that's laying all over Tokyo? And the contamination, what's the winds going to do to that? Um, Any News is also reporting that a city north of Fukushima has been evacuated. The coastal area sank due to the March 11th quake. And they are expecting up to 16 inches of rain in that area north of Fukushima. So that's when the storm is already downgrading a bit. So we'll have to monitor that closely. I put a couple links into chat, and I'll post them on the Radchick page as well. What is the difference, too? I've been getting asked between a hurricane, a cyclone, and a typhoon. They're all the same. They just use different names for these storms in different places. This is right off NOAA's site. In the Atlantic and Northeast Pacific, the term hurricane is used. The same type of disturbance in the Northwest Pacific is called a typhoon. And a cyclone, when it occurs in the South Pacific and Indian Ocean. The ingredients for these storms include a pre-existing weather disturbance, warm tropical oceans, moisture, and relatively light winds. If the right conditions persist long enough, they can combine to produce the more violent winds, incredible waves, torrential rains, and floods that we associate with this. In the Atlantic, hurricane season officially runs June 1st to November 30th. However, while 97% of tropical activity occurs during this time period, there's nothing magical in these dates, and hurricanes have occurred outside of these six months. The other bad news is right behind this storm is another one for Japan. And I'm not sure what the estimated track is on that, but I will find out and include that in the forecast later today. Here in the States... And in Canada, there's a pretty strong system that's been hovering over Minnesota, and it looks like it's in northern Wisconsin right now. I don't know what it's going to do when it crosses into the Great Lakes. The storms in this area in the northern plains were actually spawning um, tornado warnings yesterday, and it's kind of an unusual spot to see this much storm activity. Um, and then it appears to dissipate as it goes over Lake Michigan, uh, before it gets to my area, it's pretty hot here today, though. It's 90, it's supposed to be 95 today. So um, stay out of the rain. On YouTube, there's a couple channels, too, that I want to make sure you guys sub. If you're on YouTube, Mr. Comet Watch puts out good storm updates. And for Japan weather, there's a guy who lives in Tokyo and his YouTube channel is called Rob Center One, and he does some really detailed stuff um, about the the weather. He puts these out a couple times a week, uh, just under normal weather circumstances. So if you follow the weather in that area closely, you may want to sub him. ArcLight 2011, I always recommend for Europe. He gives a rundown on the European RADs. And he's got a video out today showing the London radiation uh, that he measured riding his motorcycle. And let's see what else we have up here. Also, I wanted to make mention of a major fire that's being reported in Camden, New Jersey this morning. It's a magnetic metals company that works for defense and I believe it was six alarms when I saw this video posted this morning. It's still out of control. People in the area have been warned to shut their windows and stay inside. Um, the smoke from this fire will be toxic. And uh, we will try to post something about that later on today. 
Now, just since we uh, started the show a few minutes ago, there was a pretty big earthquake off the coast of Oregon this morning, a 5-1. And just now we had a 6.0 right off the kind of the end of the Aleutian Island chain in Alaska. Hopefully that's not making its way around the Pacific Plate because there hasn't been, according to USGS feed, a whole lot of activity since that 6-4 and some smaller ones in Japan over the weekend. But I saw some in the uh, along that North Atlantic Ridge again, and it's right where all the faults are meeting too, which is really unusual. Suspicious observers put out a video too today who follows earthquakes, sun flares, um, and all kinds of interesting science articles. He puts out the two-minute news every day, and I post it on Radchick, sub him as well. One of the things that he mentioned is when we see a lot of quakes along that southern region of the the, um, Atlantic Ridge, that we see a global increase in earthquake activity. We'll have to watch that and see if he's right today. Now, something I get asked about a lot, and I don't mean to leave out the Canadians, is what is going on with the radiation monitors. And there was an article that was posted about Fukushima fallout. I believe this was in January. Let me bring up the article here. It was by Michael Platt from the Calgary Sun, and it was first posted on Sunday, January 22nd of 2012. Very important article for Canadians. Nuclear Critic says Health Canada should have issued warning on radioactive raindrops. And I want to read some of this article. Uh, I think I'm going to wait till we get back from the break, so, though, since we're heading into that. Uh, one of the um, items mentioned within the article is not wanting to panic the population by telling them, and someone named Susan on Ratchik posted what drives fear-mongering, a lack of credible information, a removal of unwanted data and data-gathering stations, censoring, lack of follow-up on seal and polar bear diseases, which look like radiation burns, silence by North American governments, etc., etc., etc. A big thank you to individuals who are doing their best to report on the very real consequences of a nuclear plant meltdown. Now, we have difficulty here in the States getting information as well, but we, of course, have the EPA RADNET monitors, even though they have been tampered with, turned down, recalibrated, and about half of them aren't even working. It's better than what Canada has, which is nothing. So when we get back, we're going to read portions of that article and also include a link for you guys in chat. Please share this around with anyone you know from Canada. And we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Welcome back to Nuked Radio, and I want to say hi to Alicia, who is listening from Wisconsin. That's my youngest daughter. This article is from the Calgary Sun by Michael Platt. There's no need to panic, probably, but not knowing whether to shrug or cower over radioactive iodine falling on Calgary as a result of a meltdown in Japan last year is Canada's top nuclear critic wondering why. There's no need to be concerned. But what you should be concerned about is why the authorities are so quick to dismiss it, says Dr. Gordon Edwards. Why aren't they just reporting this stuff and not commenting? They seem to take it upon themselves to deny there's any danger, even enough to let people know what's happening. Edwards, a university professor, is president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility and a former advisor on nuclear matters to Ottawa and the Ontario government. When it comes to radiation and the fallout following the Fukushima nuclear accident, Edwards is a thorn in the side of Health Canada, sounding the alarm when officially there isn't one. He's been pointed when saying radiation from Fukushima will lead to higher rates of cancer in Canada, though he's also quick to say the risk is tiny on a per-person basis. 
Now he's asking questions, however, about rain which fell on Calgary shortly after the nuclear disaster last March, containing radioactive iodine well above the Health Canada guidelines for drinking water. Health Canada hasn't even released the data, saying it's too small an amount to be worthy of public comment, and the same silence has applied for much of the Canadian data collected so far. While Edwards technically agrees there's very little to worry about, he says there should be something Calgarians and Canadians can decide for themselves. Boy, that's going to be in stark contrast to something I'm going to share from Arnie Gunderson shortly. There are certain people who might be concerned. For instance, a pregnant woman, says Edwards, when a baby's growing inside, that baby should not be getting a dose of radiation at a critical moment of development because when an embryo gets radiation, one damaged cell can multiply. A fetus is far more susceptible to radiation. And a fetus is likely to be is a fetus likely to be harmed by this level? No, but it could be, yes. Health Canada confirms that last March, after the Fukushima nuclear accident, a Calgary monitoring station detected an average of 8.18 becquerels per liter of radioactive iodine stemming from Japan. Canadian guidelines limit exposure to six becquerels of iodine per liter of drinking water, and much lower radiation spikes in the U.S. resulted in a don't drink the rainwater order, but not here. Edwards says Calgarians should have at least known there was a spike beyond recommended levels, especially as rainborne radiation concentrates in vegetation and the food chain. It's not up to Health Canada to decide for everybody else what they should do. They should announce the figures and let people decide for themselves. Health Canada maintains that Canadians have nothing to worry about despite Calgary's radiation peak and smaller spikes found in Vancouver, Winnipeg, and Ottawa, which continue to this day, according to some of the people on my page and on Radiation Watch. Only in Calgary did the Fukushima fallout push rain past the Canadian limit for drinking water, yet not enough for them to issue a warning. Even now, officials with the federal agency say raising red flags over a one-off sample of radioactive rain is fear-mongering. And Health Canada's senior medical advisor says there's no valid basis. Even if the level in water was close to what the upper limits would be, that would still mean someone would have to consume two liters a day all year in order to reach a level where they might possibly be at risk, says Dr. Paul Gully. Therefore, for a level to be identified in Calgary in rainwater on one occasion really means there is no risk, not in the past and not now. That's a Health Canada spokesperson, by the way. Be reassured if there was a problem and Health Canada does continuous monitoring, then Canadians would be informed. But we would not want to alarm the public by continually saying that there's no risk. There's only 19 comments on this article. This is from January, and I encourage anyone, when you see articles that are in the mainstream, that you comment um, as well to let everyone know there's other people watching what's going on. Now, this morning, this was a repost from February 21st, 2011, about an iTeam report in Houston, Texas, saying the EPA underreports radiation in America's drinking water. And this was before Fukushima. I couldn't believe some of the numbers that I read in this article. And I won't read the whole thing because it's very long, but I am going to share it with you guys. Americans remain largely in the dark about their true exposure to a number of radioactive contaminants that could be in their drinking water. Surprisingly, it's because of intentional decisions by the EPA, the federal government office that is supposed to protect the nation from contaminated water. Now remember, this is a mainstream source, I-Team investigation, Houston, Texas, prior to Fukushima. The EPA's regulatory approach dates back to the beginning of the Cold War when above-ground nuclear testing was a common occurrence. For years, man-made radiation from nuclear fallout dominated the concerns of scientists. Strontium-90 
is one such man-made contaminant found in that fallout and eventually across the world as particles from the explosions drifted in the upper atmosphere. However, KHOU has discovered the EPA never updated its regulations to make sure water utilities test for or measure certain naturally occurring types of radiation that may actually produce a far greater radiation dose and thus a greater health risk than strontium-90. For instance, lead-2010, which is not a form of lead, commonly found in pencils and other industrial uses, is a common byproduct of radon gas and in itself is radioactive. However, the EPA does not regulate the element, effectively ignoring the threat from the very real possibility of it contaminating your water. In a written statement, agency officials say they do not regulate naturally occurring radioactive lead since the rule covers man-made radionuclides only. However, lead-210 is a prime example which shows how naturally occurring radiation can harm the public more than certain man-made types. By his calculation, naturally occurring lead-210 produces nearly seven times the radiation dose to your bones as strontium-90, the man-made form of radioactive contaminant the EPA does regulate. Both radioactive elements have a tendency to target your bones and produce cancer and other health effects there. Years ago in the 1990s, the EPA considered regulating radioactive lead, but eventually decided not to do so. When it finalized changes to its rules in 2000, the agency suggested it would, instead, simply monitor for the presence of the contaminant under another federal program. The EPA recently confirmed to KHOU-TV, though, that no monitoring ever took place. So they're intentionally underreporting gross radiation exposure just from natural sources. They talk about lead-210, Radium-224, they talk about uranium in this article, and if it's going on here, I'm sure it's going on in Canada, the EPA actually allows uranium's radiation to be subtracted away from its gross alpha radiation total that you are told about. For instance, when you've just learned that how some naturally occurring radioactive elements are simply never tested to begin with. In other cases, the EPA EPA actually allows utilities to subtract off certain types of radiation that labs detect in tests of your drinking water. I'm alarmed, said Brian Ruiz, a homeowner in Harris County who gets his water from the Municipal Utility District 238. An array of emotions just came over me. He stumbled onto the subtractions allowed by the EPA after seeing KHOU's report. Each year, the local water company sent Ruiz the EPA-mandated consumer confidence report on the state of his water quality. For example, in the 2005 report, it showed his gross alpha radiation exposure was on an average of 14.5 picocuries per liter, just under the EPA's legal limit of 15 picocuries. That's because they subtracted the gross alpha particle activity of uranium in his water. I've been lied to, he said. I became outraged and I was sickened with what I saw. And welcome back. Speaking of black dust, this was just posted on any news. Unburned MOX fuel containing plutonium was in the mushroom-like cloud of black smoke when reactor number three exploded. Could this be what the black dust is that's laying around everywhere? It stinks that the black smoke from reactor number three is the suit of dangerous fuel and the white smoke is the gas caused by the hydrogen explosion. This was translated from a... City Council member Kooshi Oyama for any news. It's more dangerous when it's colored and becomes black, but there's more dangerous substances that fell out of the cloud. 
At first, the white smoke, which fell out from the side, is the hydrogen explosion, the same as for Unit 1. Then there was the vertical black smoke that looked like a mushroom, which was the unburned MOX fuel, which contains plutonium and was caused by lack of oxygen supply. The warning that I wanted to read from Arnie Gunderson was for people on the U.S. West Coast. First of all, they should have used iodine pills to protect radiation after 311, which I think we all probably should have. This was from the Capitol Forum, Fukushima Daiichi and the nuclear picture in the U.S. and internationally, a Capitol Forum with Tom Ritter from June 10th. Now, Ari says he bought the pills, but he didn't use them. He did tell his friends on the West Coast and especially in the Cascades that they should use them. I know when I told my daughter in Salt Lake City, Utah, to get some, she couldn't because the pharmacies were all out. Now, another thing that Arnie Gunderson said on Fukushima contamination in the U.S. is you need to be careful about what's on your feet, especially for the West Coast. Other than that, we can't run and we can't hide. It's everywhere. This was also from the Capitol Forum, June 10th. What this means is that you need to be careful about 80% of the dirt that gets on your shoes comes into your house. Dry dusting makes it worse. Wet dusting is really recommended. Be really careful about house cleanliness, especially on the West Coast. To me, that would be a no-brainer for anyone in the Cascades or anybody in these areas where hot particles fell out as the result of a thunderstorm. Other than that, we can't run and we can't hide. And we've talked about this before, too, with cleaning and so forth. And and Jules said that she even went as far last year as to not open her windows in her house and just keep her air running and her HEPA filters. What we've seen from recent numbers in St. Louis is that keeping those HEPA filters on might be a good idea, um, at least when it rains, and shutting your windows. I noticed just putting my Geiger in the window, and I leave my, my windows open I would year-round if I could. I hate having the house closed up. But I also make sure that I vacuum around the windowsills. I vacuum by the front door. Nobody wears their shoes in the house. The pets get wiped off when they come in, From although I've gotten kind of lazy about that, too. Um, if I had little kids, though, and the pets were laying in the kids' bed, I think I'd be a lot more careful with it. Frequent vacuuming. You know, you could vacuum your screens, too, I guess. Um, And I also wanted to mention again that ki for You, a website that sells Geiger counters, and we've read some of the stuff that they posted. Um, They've been one of the places that has had information about Fukushima since the beginning. They have offered to test your car filters and your vacuum filters, um, and even a furnace filter if you want to mail it to them and just to include uh, your name and address and self-addressed stamped envelope for the results to be sent back. They will test those things for free. It's difficult to measure some of those filters with a guy or counter. You can't obviously just hold it right over the top of it. You need to move it around and do it in sort of a grid pattern understanding that the particles are going to fall in random places or be attached to the screen. And even better way to do it in the way that I've seen Michael Collins from Enviro reported do it is to shake out all the dust, but of course be careful not to inhale it, Um, especially from like one of those HEPA filtration systems. You can slide it right off of the metal plate onto a paper plate and test the source from there, test the actual dust. If any um, people that live in the West, too, have those swamp coolers, which I know they have in some of the drier areas, I don't know if there's filters that come out of those things. I, I believe you just rinse them out with a hose. Before you rinse out your swamp cooler, you may want to run a Geiger over it, too, especially if it's been running since last March. Arnie Gunderson also said, I think people are beginning to think that maybe we can never dismantle these plants, that maybe we just have to fill them in with concrete and walk away. This comes from the same interview. 
ultimately radioactivity does leach through the concrete. Are we ever going to knock these plants down? Maybe it's just better to entomb them. I mean, that's what they did in Chernobyl. They've never been able to actually go in, retrieve the fuel, and do anything else with it. Um, that sarcophagus is actually falling apart. In fact, 10 years ago, it was recommended that it be replaced. And, you know, TEPCO has led us to believe that this decommissioning that they're doing, this 30 or 40 or 100-year schedule that they have going now, I don't even know what it's up to. I know they said when they found out they had liquefied uranium that it was probably going to take a lot longer than 40 years. Are they ever going to be able to get that stuff out of the ground, really? I mean, the cost, too, is just going to be astronomical. And then you're burning through workers when they reach their limits of exposure and that's already becoming apparent and they're trying to recruit nuclear engineers from other parts of the world to come work at that plant because the engineers that have been there are getting to the point where they can't be there anymore because the radiation doses are too high and now this has only been a year how are we going to keep people on that site for 30 or 40 or 100 years it's just not going to be possible. They'll have to entomb it, in my opinion. Also, a Tokyo professor was talking of shattered zones underneath some of the reactors that they want to restart in Japan. I mean, if that doesn't tell you that they just don't care, active fault regions, and let me see which plant this was on... Mashiko Wanatabe of Tokyo University is among those who believe the restart may come too soon. He does not oppose nuclear power, but believes scientific evidence points to the possibility of shattered zones or active faults beneath the OI power plant. And if his theory can be disproven, he says there should be no opposition to the resumption of the operation of that power plant. However, at this stage, I believe those who want to give the green light to the restart of these reactors should not offer indirect arguments, but rather should state clearly safety is not secured, but we are allowing restart for various other reasons. That's practical. There's faults under Fukushima as well. In fact, there's five active faults that were previously considered unlikely to cause quakes. And this was posted in NHK August 31st of 2011. Tokyo Electric Power Company suspects there are five active faults near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that could affect the crippled plant if they cause a tremor. TEPCO had said on Tuesday that geological deformations were observed for the first time at five faults, suggesting they are active. And there's been also some problems with the Diablo Canyon plant. There's an activated fault and an inactive, or what was thought to be an inactive fault, right off the coast, very close to the plant. And there was a researcher that was trying to bring that to light. Um, she just got lambasted by other people in the nuclear industry saying her data was completely incorrect she hadn't worked enough years to be able to make that kind of judgment although many of these things are outside of our power one thing that we can do is stay informed and share the concern that we have for our family for other families for other people, for other humans, I'm going to post a link to the earthquake map. Keep your eye on that today. And typhoon updates will be coming along as well. Everyone stay safe. And we'll see you Thursday.